And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. Although Dr. Patrick Moore worked for Greenpeace Canada and Greenpeace International between 1981 to 1986, he broke away from the organization after he concluded that the environmental movement had abandoned science and logic in favor of motion and sensationalism. On today's Alba Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1996. Through sustainable forestry, by planting a finer mosaic of age classes and forest ecosystem types across the landscape, in many it cases, was more than two decades ago that Dr. Patrick Moore first burst upon the national and international stage. He was a founder of Greenpeace, and it is with that background that he defends the forest industry. I spent 15 years leading the environmental movement on campaigns ranging from toxic dumping to nuclear explosions to saving the whales. So over those 15 years, I learned a lot about the environment and about ecology. In addition, my education is in forest biology and ecology. I grew up in a forest environment, in a forestry and fishing family, in a forestry and fishing village. So I have a lot of background to go into this discussion. It's not as if I'm just coming from being an accountant in a forestry company in an office tower in downtown Vancouver and trying to explain forest ecology to people. I am an ecologist, and I think that gives me a better understanding of the broad range of issues involved in this very difficult debate about how we should balance the economic and the environmental priorities in our forest. And balance them we must. There's simply no choice. You can't have one without the other. Moore gave a speech to members of the Terrace Chamber of Commerce this fall, in which he denounced the message being spread around the world by members of the environmental movement. We are told that the forest companies are replacing the biodiverse native forests with monoculture plantations. This is not true, and I'll show you how easy it is to fool people. I could put two different captions under this picture to give you two different ideas of what you're looking at. I could say, multinational forest corporations have clear-cut an ancient biodiverse rainforest and replaced it with a monoculture pulp plantation. Or I could say, this is a highly biodiverse second growth forest coming in entirely through natural regeneration on land that was logged in the 1950s. The second statement is 100% true. The first statement was mostly false, but the average citizen would not be able to tell which one was right or wrong just by looking at this picture. Forestry has played a large role in Moore's background. He grew up with it, his father was employed by it, and he now writes books about it. And he noted the irony that the cities in which the environmentalists live, and the farms on which they depend, leave a much more lasting mark on the land than forestry does. Forestry, if done properly, has a lot less impact on biodiversity and the species living in the forest than building cities and farms does. That's where we really cause long-term environmental damage. So you've got the problem of all the people living in the center of towns, surrounded by farmland that is basically forest that has been cleared to grow food, thinking that the real damage is being caused out in the forest, when in fact, forestry allows the forest to grow back again. Whereas people who make cities and towns with farms around them, they don't let the forest grow back again. That's where the permanent habitat loss really occurs. Moore conceded some logging practices are unwise and have damaged the ecosystem. He agreed forestry can cause salmon habitat destruction, although he says it's not the worst offender. Number one is dams, permanent cement dams. Number two is overfishing. At least that can be cured by taking the pressure off, unlike dams. Number three is urban development, the Georgia Strait situation where all of the little coho streams are being covered up with cement and housing developments. That's a permanent deforestation. Number four is agriculture. Cutting the trees right down to the river's edge and putting in cow pastures and having the chemicals and the cow manure going directly into the river. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. 
Thank you for staying with us. Five species of Pacific salmon thrive in North Pacific waters of US and Canada. Chinook, also called king, coho, pink, sockeye, and chum salmon. They begin their lives in freshwater streams, lakes, and rivers, and migrate to the sea as small fish called smokes. Let us return to their archives as Dr. Moore continues his list of worst offenders of salmon habitat. Number five is forestry. Forestry has caused damage to salmon streams, but at least forestry is repairable. When forestry causes damage, it heals, because we let the forest grow back. We let the vegetation grow back on the stream bank if it is damaged by forestry operations. Moore's message was warmly received by the Terrace Chamber audience, in contrast to the one delivered one month later, when forestry's future was again the topic of discussion. This time, the guest was the regional director of Forest Renewal BC, the controversial crown corporation that aims to create more jobs from each tree while keeping the forests healthy. FRBC is funded through increased stumpage rates and royalties paid by companies to harvest timber on crown land. You know, given that uh, we can uh, effectively harvest anything that we can either generate a profit or at least break even on. So if we add $15 a cubic meter to our operating costs, that in effect reduces those stands that are either at a break even point or uh, up to $15 a cubic meter in profit. So in effect, allowable annual cut has been reduced because our operable land base has been reduced. Now it's partially offset by in incremental silviculture, but as a forester, everybody, I think as all foresters know that the land base and the soil that's within our land base is our chief and our primary resource, and not necessarily the trees that grow on it. So the larger the land base, the more um, revenue, royalty, resources we can gather from it. My calculation is between five and ten million dollars um, that uh, companies in this area, per company, I would say Skeena Cito is probably five to ten million dollars per annum pays to support the FRBC and so does uh, Skeena Sawmills. Um, how do we keep a vibrant forest sector with these kind of uh, owner's charges? Um, companies in this area are not making money right now. This poor gentleman is just a messenger. Forest Renewal BC is a farce of the first order, and it's killing the industry in British Columbia. Look at the situation. Look at the reality. We have the longest and strongest solid wood markets we've had since the war. And the industry is in break-even or lost position because it's been stolen from it to fund this airy fairy. BC. Well, what we're attempting to do is uh, is uh, make investments here in the northwest that can lay the that can lay the foundation for a, a, a robust forest industry uh, in the in the future, so that we don't see the big cyclical cycles that we that we're now seeing down in say Golden, for example. As for Patrick Moore, he applauded some of the NDP's moves, including its efforts over the past five years to set aside more of BC as parkland, areas such as the Kitlope watershed south of Kitimat. But he says there's a limit to how far this can go. Yes, we're focused now on creating new parks, and that's good because we should double the amount of land that's protected. But at a certain point, you have to stop focusing on that. You can't make new parks forever you so, at some point have to say enough of the land has been turned into parks. Now we have to focus on the really difficult job of managing the rest of the land sustainably for timber production, food production, and housing the human population. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Christopher Zimmick had been teaching just three years in 1980 when he encountered DFO Community Advisor Joe Kambitz at a science teacher's conference. The event was called Catalyst and it was stimulated a creative collaboration that continues to this day. Let us return to the archives with Martin Forbes. This program is called uh, Salmon Salmonoids in the Classroom, and it is uh, it was started in 1977 through the Department of Fisheries, and it's just grown and grown throughout the throughout the years. And um, to this point now, in this area, um, every school in town has at least one 
classroom incubator in their classrooms, and it's just been a huge success. And it is um, there is um, a criteria, a teaching criteria that the, the teachers have um, large binders to go through with the, the students the life cycle of the salmon. The young students took some of the salmon eggs and milt back to school where they watched as fertilization took place. The developing eggs will stay in the dark, quiet aquarium until the end of December. That's when the kids will be able to look inside and see what's developed. In May or June, they'll release the fry back into the Lake Else River. The biggest part of the program is just to, to educate the kids on the importance of our salmon resource in our area. And um, I, th I really feel that we're really getting through to them. I mean, often and when they, I often get approached by parents, you know, telling me, telling me how about their grade four student, telling his dad or mother about, you know, all the life cycle of the Pacific salmon, you know, so it's great. An older group of students also got some hands-on experience with coho salmon, this time at the E.B. Street Hatchery. The grade 11 forestry class from Caledonia came to check out a brood stock collected by the DFO and Kitsum Kalum Fish Hatchery. Well, at Cal, we try to get students out into the field uh, several times in the semester, and it is a field-oriented type of course. We do much of the theory at school in the classroom, and then we try to work in a trip or two. And Martin Forbes is excellent. He's certainly helped us get organized and opportunity to come out and watch the uh, action. I think it's, it really sinks in, you know, exactly, you know, the whole life cycle rather than through a textbook, you know, and I, I think it did today with their hands on. And they could see at first they were a little hesitant, and after a while, boy, they were really getting into it, and they had crews all over the place. It was really good. Members of the Kitsum Kalum Fish Hatchery hooked up with the DFO to collect the eggs, as there isn't enough room at their facility to hold the adult salmon. We uh, take our, our eggs from Hebe Street here, and we take them to, uh, to the Kitsum Kalum Hatchery and for incubation. Um, now, why, now is it just the coho that you take from the Evie Hatchery? Uh, yeah, just the coho from here. Uh, we uh, do chum from Andesite Creek. This initiative today is just another good example of uh, both Department of Fisheries and First Nations working together for the, the resource, the salmon itself, you know, and that's, that's the important thing here is, is the fish habitat and some of our enhancement procedures to boost some of these stocks up to a level that we can harvest them again through a sport fishery, commercial fishery, or food fishery, native food fishery. And so, uh, and at the same time, making sure there's enough adult salmon on the reds to reassure the, the numbers for the following years. After all the egg taking was done, two members of the stock assessment division from Prince Rupert took a number of different tissue samples from the salmon. And they're going out throughout our region um, basically taking DNA samples from uh, different salmon stocks in our creeks and rivers. Basically, through the, the DNA testing, the tissue samples that they take, um, extract from the, from the carcasses, is a way of another possibility of, uh, um, say, it, um, finger imprinting. You know, uh, that's sort of another avenue to distinguish uh, through DNA the timing of runs, uh, where the, what different streams, different stocks uh, migrate to, and it's just another tool that we may be able to use uh, in the management decisions of uh, through commercial fishing or or enhancement activities. Uh, this. Um, finger imprinting technique. And before it was all said and done, one more use was found for the fish. Several carcasses went to the Kitsilis community to make fish jerky for elders. It's a good example of the concern First Nations people have about wasting natural resources. Everything that they take from the sea or from the river or from the land, they give back to it again. And uh, like when they go out hunting, they do the prayers and they give thanks to the land because you and I don't know the strength of this land we're standing on. And the, the, the strength of the trees or the strength of this little river here, you and I don't know, you know. And that's why they, they do a lot of that uh, thanks, uh, giving thanks to what they take from the earth. I've never seen a group of uh, uh, coho salmon being used for so much in one spot. Uh, you know, we use them for brood stock today, uh, DNA testing today, and um, 
six carcasses were also taken from uh, uh, First Nations uh, elder to uh, <coughs> use as dried um, fish that they're going to smoke and, and brine later on, which is just an excellent example of, of the, the use of the fish. Before leaving the E.B. Street hatchery, Martin Forbes wanted to show off the facelift given to the facility over the summer. It was upgraded with the help of students in the Skeena Observer Program. Through the, the community of Terrace, we got donations from um, convoy roofing, uh, Skeena sawmills, co-op, uh, Terrace builders, early bird, and the district of Terrace, some gravel, to uh, basically for materials and uh, they were, which were donated and then with the observer program and some uh, technical help, we were able to construct this mini little hatcher here to improve our, our, our incubation uh, procedure here at Evie Street. The Kitimat Fish Hatchery also donated a stack of heat trays which operate on a gravity fed system using the high quality spring water. The upgrade will make life easier for the volunteers who take care of the fish through the winter. And in the spring, the 15 year tradition of releasing thousands of salmon fry raised in the hatchery will repeat itself. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Indigenous people of North America have a long history of tattooing. Tattooing is not a simple marking of the skin. It was a process of highlighting cultural connections to Indigenous ways of knowing and viewing the world, as well as connections to family, society, and place. In this final segment of Open Connection, let us return to their archives with Richard Lachance. Now people of all ages and backgrounds are turning their bodies into living art by getting designs or pictures tattooed onto their skin. Not surprisingly, the trend has reached Smithers. A tanning and body piercing shop opened up recently and with it comes a part-time tattoo artist. Richard Lachance has a shop in Terrace and will be traveling to Smithers once a month for three or four days to leave his mark on people wanting in on the tattoo craze. A long time ago, when it was just sailors and bikers and that kind of thing, you know, it was a stereotype. There used to be like six colors, and and it was real thick lines. And now it's starting to get into more artistic things, rather than just a ship or a mermaid or something. You know, it's pretty much anything. Portraits. People are doing portraits of their kids, and you know, so there's a lot of uh, a lot more to choose from. So I think that's why people are starting to get into it, as long along with piercing as well. LaShawns figures he's drawn about 5,000 tattoos in the four years he's been in business. Despite those numbers, he doesn't call himself an artist. He saves that lofty title for only a handful of tattooists who are very well known. LaShawns has seen a lot in his short time in the business and does have his own standards. He won't tattoo any racist or satanic phrases on anyone. Tattoo every, every area you can think of. You know, I won't do certain areas like hands or feet or faces or heads or anything because they, it takes a long time to heal and people just aren't happy with them after they're healed. So I just don't do those areas anymore, but uh, everywhere else is pretty much fair game. Sean says half his clients are women. Lorraine Morgan, who owns Sienna Tanning in Smithers, where Rich works, says it took three years to find this tattoo. I'd rather have a picture on my body than on my wall. What about when you're uh, 73 years old and you're starting to shrink? <laughs> She'd be the coolest grandma on the block. Coolest grandma, no. <laughs> I'm very fascinated with older people and their accomplishments in their lives. I don't know why it sounds corny, but it is. Um, my grandpa was a real inspiration in my life. And when he passed away, he, um, he, was, he was a great man. And um, I figured when I'm old and gray, these people could uh, look at my uh, tattoos and whatever if I'm on the beach or something like that and think, oh, well, she's done some things in her life or she's had some, you know, experiences and stuff like that, I guess. Sure, it's a trend, but everyone has their own reasons for getting a tattoo. I just seen it and I liked it and I wanted it, so I got it. <laughs> and why in that particular spot? Um, not sure, it just kind of looks nice there. I have this one, one man that I, that I tattoo quite a bit, and uh, he used to drink a lot, and he stopped drinking, and he does tattoos now to kind of keep his mind off of drinking. It's something else to do rather than, than drinking. 
drinking, staying, you know, something that's something to keep him sober, I guess. I don't but whatever, whatever works, I suppose. I love the art. Um, this picture here is to enhance her face. Like, it's her, but it's just what she looks like. And this is, like, for my kids and myself. Not only have styles and colors changed over the years, so have safety measures. At one time, it was somewhat risky getting a tattoo. You could get a serious infection or even a fatal disease. I only use needles, one set of needles once, and then I destroy them, take them, get rid of them. And uh, before I uh, even use the needles, everything is, is autoclaved in a uh, hospital sterilization unit. And, uh, and then I use a uh, cold sterilizer as well. It's, it's, uh, you put, it's, some, it's like a soak where you put things in it for a period of time, and that helps for the cleansing and that kind of thing. And uh, just, I wear gloves and, you know, things like that, so if everything is, is autoclave, it should be a problem. Even with safety issues taken care of and mainstream society's growing acceptance of tattoos, LaShawn says some people still think only criminals and bikers have them. I remember walking into a motel in, uh, in Manitoba with a tank top on in the middle of summer. And I asked for a room, and they wouldn't give me a room. And so I came back, and the ship changed 20 minutes later, and there was a new person on. They said there was nothing there. And when I come back, they said, oh, sure, we'll give you a room. But the second time, I wore a shirt. And that time, they gave me a room. It took LaShance two years to find a landlord who would let him open up his shop. Meanwhile, Morgan says some people don't even know she has tattoos, and she plans to keep it that way. A, a little old lady comes in, or, you know, Something like that. I'll put my my gown on, you know, or I'll, I'll be wearing um, pants that day or instead of a skirt too. So I, I give, um, there's still respect there. You know, I don't just show them off all the time. If I want to, I will, and if I don't, well, I don't. They both wish all people would be more accepting of tattooing, saying it's a fun and memorable experience, but it does hurt a little bit. It's hard to explain that kind of a pain. Um, I would say it's like a cat scratch that won't stop, or a mosquito bite that keeps on going. Is it hurting, Brian? Uh, yeah, some spots, yeah. If I tried to read my mind on it, but it's a hard thing to do. <laughs> I tried blocking the ears, but it's still feel that vibration. I'm <laughs> done. LaShawns has some words of wisdom if you're thinking about getting a tattoo. Just make sure you ask a lot of questions and uh, see some photos first. Make sure you get to see some photos, some work that they actually have done. Um, ask around, have actually see some some tattoos that have been done by the artist. Um, things like that before you, before you do anything. Make sure everything is clean and then you see a, a, a health board a plaque or diploma on your wall. Make sure everything is, is up and up. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictel.